News flash, Jesus offers God's latest and greatest. We continue our series in the book of Hebrews this morning, and now we're up to chapter 8. It begins like this. Now, the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now, he's told us his main point, and his main point, of course, is Jesus. But a couple of things about Jesus in particular. First of all, Jesus has taken his seat. That's right, because he's done everything he needs to do, because it's a finished work now, Jesus Christ has taken his seat. Now, the obvious question for us is, what position are you in? What position are you in in regard to your sins? Are you up running around trying to get right and stay right? Are you running around the USA, running around North America, running around planet Earth, trying to get right and stay right through what you do? Or are you seated with Jesus Christ? Because he's done. The work is over. It needs no repeat. He is relaxing, and you should too. Maybe that's the whole point of the book of Hebrews, right? Relax. Relax in God's new way of grace. This is God's latest and greatest. It's been offered to us. Will you sit down and enjoy all that the Father has brought you? Now, the second thing we notice about Jesus here in this first verse is that he is a heavenly priest, that he is God-ordained, a heavenly priest, an eternal priest. So he's done, but he's also got the authority to say he's done. He needs not wait on another priest who will replace him. He'll never die. He always lives on. He's a perpetual priest. He's always representing. You're saved forever because he always lives to intercede for you. So do you see it? This very first verse, it brings so much hope and so much inspiration, bragging on Jesus from the very beginning. A minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. Notice the emphasis on true, the true tabernacle. Now, the Jews of that day, they knew all about the tabernacle. You know, the history of God with them traveling through the desert. God allows them to escape from the Egyptians. God parts the waters and they walk right through only to find that the Egyptian chariots are consumed by the waves afterwards. So they're familiar with all that their ancestors enjoyed. They're familiar with the beautiful escape that God provided. And then the time in the wilderness, in the desert. And they're also familiar with that uh, sanctuary, right? That tabernacle that was temporary, a tent that was pitched for God to visit them in the Holy of Holies, only to be replaced later, the tabernacle replaced by a temple, something more permanent and yet something that is not so permanent. And that's the whole point. Because everything that was done for that tabernacle and everything that was done for that temple, we're going to find out in just a moment, it's a copy, it's a shadow, it's a picture of a heavenly reality, and that we enjoy the real thing, the spiritual version today. So it's like a a 2D drawing of a 3D reality. It's just a shadow, a symbol, a picture. You remember the analogy of a tree and its shadow. The shadow can show you the shape of the tree, basically. It can show you the outline of the tree. The shadow on the ground, if you know your math, you can calculate the height of the tree. But the shadow is not the tree, and the tree is not the shadow. And likewise, this tabernacle, which would later be a temple, Those were nothing but shadows. They were never intended to be the reality. And so we see this in detail in the coming verse. 
It says here, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. In the Old Testament, the high priest would offer sacrifices and gifts seeking to through the law, appease the deity. Through the law, satisfy God. And God was saying, I need blood. I need blood sacrifice. The law requires it. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so with the shedding of blood, there was a temporary covering. And that was a beautiful gift. It was an offering on behalf of the people of Israel to God. And that day of atonement, it would come around every 365 days. Every year, like clockwork, they would try to get more forgiveness, more covering. But that was still a shadow. Do you realize that not one of those bulls or goats actually took away sins? It is impossible Hebrews says, impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Even those animals were a shadow and a picture, and only Messiah could do what he did. And so we're seeing a parallel here. The Old Testament priests, they would offer sacrifices again and again and again, and Jesus offered a sacrifice too, but it was once. It was once for all because it needed no repeat. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law. We've been over this, right? I mean, Jesus is an illegal priest according to the law. If he were on earth still with that lineage, with that heritage, if he were on earth with the passport from the tribe of Judah, if he were on this planet still, then that would show his mortality. It would show that he's not the heavenly priest that so many claim he is. But where is he? He's seated at the right hand of God. That's how the chapter began. Jesus has taken his seat right next to the Father. He has all authority to serve as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Remember the mystery man, this beautiful lineage and heritage that is so different from the tribe of Levi. And so if he were on earth, well then, that would mean something altogether different, that he was merely mortal, that he would have an end of days. But what do we know about him? He always lives. He's a perpetual priest. He always represents, and that means you're always forgiven, you're always cleansed, and you're always saved. Who serve a copy, it says, a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For see, he says, see that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. All right, there's Moses. He's on the mountain, and he's shown a picture of heaven. I mean, he's got a little window into a heavenly tabernacle, a heavenly temple, and he's being given dimensions, and he's told exactly how to build it on earth, and maybe he has some flashbacks to what God showed him on that mountain. But nevertheless, what ultimately is built down to the very inch What is built there is instructed by God, and it's not random. It is based on a heavenly reality. You know, it's interesting to me because I look at the Holy of Holies, and then I look at the other courts and the way that there were three, basically the tabernacle and the temple have three main parts to them. And likewise, have you thought about it? You have three main parts. You are spirit, soul, and body. And where does God take up residence? In the holy of holies, in your spirit, at the centermost part of your being. And then the way you relate to others through the soul, that sort of mirrors what was the next court in, in that tabernacle or temple, the next area where people would gather. They couldn't go into the holy of holies, but they could mingle and be a part of all that was happening outside that Holy of Holies region. But only the high priest could go in, and only once a year, and only if he did everything right. How is that a shadow? 
Well, for us, we have a holy of holies where Christ lives, but we don't need permission daily. We've been qualified forever. We have boldness and confidence to experience the presence of Christ Jesus himself every day, all day long. Wherever we go, we take the holy of holies with us. And it is expressed, Jesus is expressed through our personality, through our soul, through our body, that outer court of the body. I mean, isn't it beautiful? Yet another way to look at this shadow. So there's a, there's a heavenly picture that was given to Moses. And then the result was an earthly construction project. Yet never forget that you're a mobile holy of holies. That you literally are like God's mobile device walking around planet earth containing the very presence of God himself. What an honor. What a privilege. You know, this is what we read in Scripture when it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who is at work within you. And so they were very much trembling and in reverence and in awe of the Holy of Holies, weren't they? I mean, you remember, if they didn't do it right, you might hear the priest, his head hits that floor, they drag him out, having a rope tied to his ankle. This was the rumor about those days and how they handled it because nobody wanted to go in there to go get him. So there was trembling and there was definitely fear and reverence and awe, a holy fear, a godly fear. Likewise, we can have that reverence and awe and godly fear, not being scared of him, but recognizing how awesome this is to have the holy of holies within us today. We are one spirit with the Lord. And so that tabernacle was a shadow of what we possess. But we've got the reality, and that's a big deal. Jesus is greater. The new covenant is better. And the presence of God is stronger in us because we're one with him. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. A better ministry, a better covenant, and better promises. Can it get any better? I mean, wow, do you see this? So I guess I would ask you, what in the world are we doing flirting with a worse ministry when we've got a better ministry? Why would we play around with worse promises, that is, less powerful promises? The idea that, Please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Renew a right heart, a a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, Lord. These were the utterances of David in the Old Testament. David, a man after God's own heart. And that sounded really good. It was pious, and it was holy, and it was to be honored. The words of David, are you kidding me? Of course We should look to them and study them and understand them. But at the same time, if we don't conclude that we have a better ministry and a better covenant and better promises today, then we've missed the whole point of Jesus Christ coming to hang on that cross and rise from the dead. He came to give us something greater, something better, and that's why you don't see Peter, Paul, James, or John trying to get more of the Holy Spirit or worried they might lose out on the Holy Spirit or that God's grace might dry up someday, that the blood of Jesus might run out. No, there's no begging for a new heart, a cleaner heart, a better heart, a right spirit because we have a new spiritual heart. And we are the holy of holies. At the center of your being, you are born of God, and God himself lives in you. So treat that with reverence and awe, because it is awesome. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought 
for a second. People are so leery about law bashing and law hating, and we're so afraid that we'll be called antinomians. Have you heard that term, antinomian? Antinomian is against the law. Literally, that's what the prefix and the root mean. Anti meaning against, and then nomian referring to the law, the Old Testament law. So the question is, are we today antinomian? And the short answer is no, we're the only ones who are respecting the law. Remember, if you pick your favorite parts of the law, that's not respecting it. If you find, as you do in so many denominations, that people are taking 613 laws and chopping out their favorite portions, you know, deleting the Sabbath, deleting the ceremonial law, keeping tithing. Oh, wait a minute, we're going to delete tithing, keep the Sabbath and get rid of the ceremonial law. Well, wait, we're going to do tithing and the Sabbath. And do you wonder then why we're chopped up in all these denominations? It's because everybody's cherry-picking from the law to try to get it the way they like it, and then they have the assumption that they can keep it. And what a joke. It is laughable, right? Because what we're seeing here is that there was always fault Under the old covenant, it was not faultless. If it had been faultless, there would be no reason in the world for Jesus to show up on the scene with a new covenant. So we respect the law and we say 613 commands, wow, no way, I can't do it. And I need God's grace instead. And when you make that pivot, when you pull that 180, recognizing the perfect and impossible standard of God's law, pivoting away from it to receive his grace, then and only then have you truly respected Moses. Anybody who looks at the law and says, yeah, I can do that. Oh yeah, let me just pick my favorite parts. I can do that. Anybody who treats the law like multiple choice or choose your own adventure, they're kidding themselves and that is not respecting God's law. So, law haters, I don't know, I've never met one. Law bashers, I've never met one. Everybody I know would agree that the law is holy and perfect and good. The debate is not whether it's good. The debate is whether we can keep it. And I am clearly saying we cannot. And God knew that all along. The law was just a shadow, and it was a tutor to lead us to Christ. And now that we've seen we need His grace and His grace alone, why would we go back to a tutor? Why go back to tablets of stone when we have the life of Jesus Christ inside of us? And so if there had been nothing wrong with that whole situation, Jesus wouldn't have brought us a new way. The law is good, but we're no good under it. The law is holy, but we're not holy under it. The law is blameless and flawless and awesome and incredible, but you put me under it, and it's a nightmare. It's a disaster. The law came in so that sin might increase. Do you hear that? That's Scripture. Paul tells us the law came in so that the trespass, the sin, the transgression would actually increase and multiply so that people would see. Remember the analogy of the mirror. Everybody says the law is a mirror. But you know what? My mom, growing up, I remember she had that magnified mirror. You know, the one that you flip? Well, you flip it and it's ten times magnification. And that's what Jesus was doing. If you've never understood what Jesus was doing in the Sermon on the Mount, he's flipping the mirror. The Jews already had the law. They thought, wow, I'm doing great. I'm avoiding murder. I'm avoiding adultery. I'm a good guy. I'm living a good life. And Jesus flips the mirror. And he says, ever looked at anybody with lust? It's the same. Ever been angry at somebody? It's the same. And so by flipping the mirror, people start to see the law for what it really is, the true spirit of the law. And then they see, oh, I get it now. I am not going to be faultless under this system. I'm going to fail every day. And if the law requires perfection, I've got no hope here. So where is my hope 
going to come from? Enter Jesus Christ with a real hope, a new way that's based on him and what he's done, not on what we're doing. For finding fault with them, notice the fault is with the people, not the law, but the people. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It's a new covenant. At least for Israel, it's the new covenant. But for us, it's the one and only. I mean, I don't know about you, I'm an American. Maybe you're American or Canadian or Australian. Perhaps you're British. It doesn't matter whether you're from the continent of Africa or Asia. It doesn't matter your background. We all have something in common. If we're not Jews, we're known as Gentiles. And for the Gentile, it is the one and only covenant. It was new to Israel, to the house of Judah, brand new. Because they had the old, they called it the new. But for us, it's the gospel. It's the one and only covenant. We were never invited to the law to begin with. So here's this author writing a group of Hebrews. And of course, he's calling it the new covenant. Now, I've heard a lot of stuff over the years that I've been in ministry. I've heard some people say, well, the new covenant is for Israel and the gospel is for the Gentiles and never the two shall meet. They're different messages. That is absolute nonsense. We see the Apostle Paul using this same term, new covenant, as he's talking to Corinthians. Yes, Greek people in the city of Corinth. He says that we are ministers of the new covenant. He's assuring them and inspiring them and motivating them to communicate the new covenant. And they are Gentiles, they are Greeks in the city of Corinth. What's my point? It's the new covenant for the Corinthians, and it's the new covenant for the Hebrews. It's all the same message. The new covenant, a.k.a. the gospel of grace, a.k.a. the gospel. It's all the same message, and it's about Jesus. And so here in verse 8, he's saying he found fault with them. So God says, behold, days are coming. I'll effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. But he didn't leave the Gentiles out, did he? I will call a people who are not my people, my people. We're grafted in. We're included. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. We get to be a part of this unifying message in Jesus Christ. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I, ouch, I did not care for them, says the Lord. What do you notice about this new way? It's nothing like the old covenant. It's not like that Old Testament experience. It's brand new and it's different on purpose. You know why? Because they couldn't keep up their end of the bargain. That's why. They stood at the, at the foot of Mount Sinai and they told God, we will do everything. They said to Moses, right to his face, we promise we will obey everything written in the book of the law, the Torah, the whole thing. And you know what happened? They didn't do it. And so there was a faithfulness issue, a problem with their endurance. They were no good at obedience. They were smelting a golden calf within minutes. They were horrible at it. And God knew. He saw all of this. I mean, who was it that really wanted the law? Now, hang on, follow this, because we're going back to the Garden of Eden. Who really wanted the law? Well, it was Adam and Eve who wanted the knowledge of good and evil. Just give it to us. We're going to take it from that tree, whether you want us to have it, God, or not. We're going to take it. The knowledge of good and evil. But that wasn't God's intention that wasn't his original design. And that's not where the kingdom of God ends up either. You see the conclusion that God's agenda 
once we've chosen law and once Israel experiences law, God's idea is grace. God's idea is that we live from his life in an atmosphere of liberty. We find freedom in God's grace. We also find victory over sin in God's grace. It's counterintuitive. If I want victory over sin, I would think, bring me the rules. Bring me the self-discipline. Bring me the principles. I'll try harder and get stronger every day. That's what human intuition says. But once again, we're eating from that tree if we're not careful. Because God's design is His grace, and His grace is enough. And so they didn't continue in my covenant, and I didn't care for them, says the Lord. And that's why the new covenant had to be way different than the old. Now, verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It's a download. God's passions and desires, everything he wants for humanity, suddenly downloaded to our hearts and our minds so that we get it and we know it, but we also want it. If he had just put it on our minds, that would be torturous to know what God wants, but to not desire it. To know what God longs for us, but to not will it or want it or crave it or long for it. That would be torturous. And so God did something better. He doesn't just make us aware of the fruit of the Spirit, aware of our minds being renewed, but He also handcrafted a new heart for us. He took out our heart of stone, the cutting away, the circumcision of our spiritual heart, and then the giving, the gifting of a brand new heart. A brand new heart that fits with His perfect compatibility I will cause them to will and to do of my good pleasure. He's not just causing you to do. He's causing you to will or to want what pleases him. That's the new covenant. Desires from within. So that you get to be yourself and please God at the same time. You get to be yourself and express Jesus without any conflict. You don't have to be somebody else. You get to be you and live from the heart and give from the heart being who you truly are. This isn't feel-good stuff. It's not about your self-esteem. You're welcome to feel good. I think we should feel good about what Jesus has done, but this is not self-help, and it's not a pep talk. This is reality, man. You have a surgery that was performed at the core of your being, and you either know about it or you don't know about it. And if you don't know about it, you might think you want to sin and you'll be miserable. So I'm just saying, here's reality. You've had a surgery. And yeah, you can feel good about it, but it can also change the choices that you make. It can also change the decisions you go for. Because when you realize that holiness and righteousness is real, not fake, it's not God's view of you so you can feel good on a Monday, it's just plain reality. God knows reality. And in reality, when you called upon Him, He did a radical transformation, cutting away the old you and giving you a brand new heart. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me from the least to the greatest. Oh, man, I wish I was like her. She sure does know the Lord. Man, I wish I could be like him. He, he's definitely a prayer warrior, and he knows the Lord. I long for that one day for me to know the Lord. Have you ever found yourself thinking or feeling those things? What does this say? They will all know me from the least to the greatest. That means you've got an intuitive knowing of God. Through Jesus, God has deposited a knowledge of him. You don't have to grasp for him, wait or beg or plead or hope for some sort of new awakening. You have Jesus, and through him, you do know God. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember 
their sins no more. The new covenant, it's not just a a download of new desires. It's also a deletion of all your mess ups. Every time you've sinned, every time you've failed, all the stuff that you're embarrassed about and ashamed of, all the stuff that would cause us to end up in the fetal position in the corner of the room wondering, am I okay? Am I still saved? Am I all right? Did I mess this up? Did I blow it? Why do I keep struggling with the same thing? There's no way he forgives me. Well, here's the good news. He doesn't forgive you. He's already forgiven you. People who are waiting for God to forgive them daily, well, if if that's our mentality, we just don't get it. God is not forgiving us daily. He's already forgiven you. You've got a free pass. Get out of jail free card? Yes, his name is Jesus. And it's free to you because it cost him everything. So let's stop apologizing for the free grace of God and let's recognize what Jesus bought. When Jesus buys something with his life and gives it to you, you better take it and it has to be free because you could never pay anyway. And so he remembers your sins no more. If God remembers your sins no more, why are you remembering them? If he keeps no record, why do you keep a record? If he's already let it go, would you let it go? What if the holy spiritual move is to let it go? What if the most mature thing you can do about your sins is agree with God that you're forgiven and let it rest? So you can get some rest. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. That phone booth, you don't see it much anymore, do you? Why not? We have something better. How about to that blockbuster video store? You don't see many of those, do you? Why not? Because we have something better today. And so because when something better comes along, it's just intuitive and obvious. It's a no-brainer to just let the old go and hang on to the new because it's better technology. It's founded on better principles. And that's what we're seeing here. There's a new covenant and it renders the old obsolete, weak, and useless because it made nobody perfect but through this new way. You've been made perfect, so let go of the old. Hang on to the new. You as a Gentile were never even invited to the old. Welcome to the new. Don't let your conscience kill you anymore. Let your conscience be programmed by God's grace. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this new way of grace. We thank you for Jesus We're starting to believe you, Father. We're starting to believe that dead religion doesn't work. We've tried our rules. We've tried our legalism. We've tried our Bible Belt theology of try harder. And we're starting to realize maybe it doesn't actually work. We're also beginning to put our confidence in you like never before. We thank you for this letter to the Hebrews, how convincing it is, how beautiful it is. Our trust is in Jesus Christ and Him alone. He is our life. He is our everything. Father, thank you. In His name we pray. Amen.